Thank you very much for joining our webinar called Theranostic Emulsions for Inflammatory Diseases from Design to Scale Up and Beyond. I'm Kyle Jandrasitz. I work for Microfluidics and with me here is Dr. Yelena Janic from Duquesne University. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about microfluidics and then after that I'm going to have Yelena take over providing the bulk of the presentation. At the end of her presentation, we'll have a few minutes for question and answer. Please feel free to ask us any questions throughout the presentation using the question and answer tab at the top of your screen. And we will try to get to these at the end of the presentation. If we run out of time or you have additional questions, please feel free to email me. My email address is listed on this screen. This slide talks about microfluidics. Uh, we've been in business for over 30 years and we have thousands of customers worldwide. Microfluidizers produce nanomaterials for many different applications, primarily for pharmaceutical ingredients. Uh, several of these drugs are currently on the market and have been approved for delivery. This slide shows what microfluidics does best. Uh, we create nano emulsions. We do cell disruption for biotechnology um, with a very high protein recovery. Uh, we're very efficient at particle size reduction and encapsulation. This technology is also used for nanodispersions and deagglomeration applications. At the bottom here, you can see a variety of microfluidizer machines, as well as the core technology, the fixed geometry interaction chamber. This is a schematic of the microfluidizer processor. On the left side is an inlet reservoir. This allows for continuous processing of a variety of materials. Uh, this also allows a high solid loading, uh, also high viscosity, as well as a wide range of temperatures. One of the key characteristics of the microfluidizer processor is the constant pressure intensifier pump. Uh, this is important because it delivers all of the material at a very uniform pressure profile to the interaction chamber. The interaction chamber is really the heart of the microfluidizer processor. As mentioned before, it is a fixed geometry microchannel, which ensures that all of your material is being processed at a very constant shear rate. These are a couple cartoons of the two different types of interaction chambers that we sell. Uh, the one on the left is a Y-type interaction chamber. This is ideal for emulsions and liquid only formulations. The one on the right is what we call the Z-type interaction chamber. This is ideal for formulations that contain solids. Uh, both of these are made out of very wear resistant material like polycrystalline diamond. They're also able to be cleaned in place and steamed in place. And they come in a variety of different sizes, as well as these two shapes that we just discussed. The main benefit of the microfluidizer processor is the extremely high shear rate we are able to generate, much higher than any other technology. And the inherent scalability of our process. When we scale, we add additional microchannels that are placed in parallel to ensure that every microliter gets the same processing conditions. Also to ensure that the processing conditions you are able to achieve at the lab scale can be copied and replicated at the production scale. This is a brief summary of the information that I just presented. These are some of the key features and benefits of our technology. Microfluidizer processor has constant pressure processing with a very high potential processing pressure up to 30,000 PSI. The core technology is the fixed geometry interaction chamber and multi-slotted interaction chambers are available for scaling up. These features result in a very small particle size potential, a very constant processing resulting in very narrow particle size distribution, and we guarantee scale up from the lab scale to the production scale. As you can see, the image at the top right is the LV1, uh, which is capable of processing one milliliter at a time. Uh, below it is a pharmaceutical grade M7250-20 uh, that is able to generate the exact same results in a CGMP environment at 8 liters per minute. And without further ado, I'm going to pass this off to Dr. Janic, uh, who is going to be able to take us through her presentation. My name is Dr. Janic. I'm from Duquesne University and Associate Professor of Pharmaceutics in Graduate School of Pharmaceutical Sciences in my own school of pharmacy. I'm also founder and co-director of Chronic Pain Research Consortium at Duquesne University and I'm a faculty member in McGowan Institute for Regenerative Medicine. And today I'm going to talk about uh, theranostic nanomotions for inflammatory diseases from design to scale up and beyond. Uh, this 
represents uh, about five years of research in my group at Duquesne University. So if you don't know, Duquesne University is located downtown Pittsburgh. This is a beautiful uh, view of our campus. It has nine schools of study and has biomedical engineering program recently added. It has about 6,000 undergraduate and 4,000 graduate students. Uh, in 2014, the King University gave 145 doctor degrees and 834 master's degrees. It has 993 faculty and uh, about 50-50% soft full-time and part-time. It's designated as a research university with high activity, so we have research funding from NSF, NIH, uh, a variety of foundations, and diversity of our research is quite uh, big. We have research in pharmaceutical sciences, nanotechnology, biology, neuroscience, um, variety of projects in social sciences and beyond. A little bit about me. I I come from Belgrade University, where I got my pharmacy degree in 98. I worked as a pharmacist for about a year, and then I moved to the United States, and I got my PhD at the University of Pittsburgh Pharmacy School. I started at Duquesne in 2009, and I was recently promoted to associate professor, so I've been at Duquesne University for about six years. The theme of our discussion today is theranostics, not medicine. Theranostics stand for therapeutic and diagnostics combined into a single entity. And the focal point of this discussion and much of research recently is nanomedicines. Why we would formulate a theranostic? Well, the goal is to try to understand drug delivery so we can image in live organisms drug delivery. It would be nice if we could image drug release, and there's some examples of that. And we also want to image drug efficacy. And the last end um, on this slide of the spectrum is what the focus was of our research. Can we use nanomedicines to image drug delivery, but also understand the efficacy of that drug delivery? core reason to go into theranostic nanomedicine over nanomedicine or medicine in general is to try to personalize the treatment during the treatment. So this little schematic shows you that ideal theranostic will be one pill, one formulation that combines therapeutic and diagnostic entities. And what that should allow us during treatment to adjust the treatment as the uh, patient progresses towards healing or adjust the treatment if there are some problems with the dosing regimen. So if you use general dose, everybody gets the same thing. That may work for some patients and not for the others. But if you have a theranostic, and the theranostic feeds you information over the course of treatment, how the treatment is uh, progressing, and also, more importantly, how the patient responds, then you can make very fine-tuned adjustments along the treatment. There is a nice uh, feature article in Chemical Engineering News talking about personalizing nanomedicines that was published in 2011, uh, written by Lauren Wall. So you can learn more about nanomedicines and theranostics from there. The focal point of our research is actually very broad, and that is inflammation. Inflammation is behind many diseases, and actually majority of current chronic diseases that have high utilization of medical care is like Alzheimer's, arthritis, autoimmune diseases, cancer, and so on. The underlying pathology for a lot of these diseases is inflammation. So we propose that theranostic nanomedicine can be designed in such a way that can address a lot of issues with one formulation or a formulation platform. So our target was inflammation in a more generalized way. So what is inflammation? There are two types of inflammation broadly described as acute and chronic. And this is a very general description showing you the subtle differences between acute inflammation and chronic inflammation. We need inflammation in our body 
It's our defense mechanism. So if we have injury or infection or we experience trauma, the inflammatory response will be triggered. And ideally, that inflammation will go on for a while and resolve and allow us to come back to normal function. It will also help us remove these um, agents that cause the injury, remove the bacteria, remove the virus. The problem comes about when the acute inflammation starts to transition and progress into what we call chronic inflammation. That's inflammation that persists long before the injury or infection has been removed. Some viral infections or chronic infections will lead to chronic inflammation, but a lot of times the injury itself will lead to chronic inflammation. Something happens between acute and chronic inflammation, and we think the dysfunction of inflammatory cells, for example, macrophages, might play in a role. Inflammation, of course, should lead to healing, but in the case of chronic inflammation, that healing is also dysfunctional and, leads, and can lead to fibrosis and loss of function of the organ system. And that's what we would like to prevent. Macrophages play a central role in both acute and chronic inflammation. And this is a very complicated slide, but in simplest terms, there are two types of macrophages, M1 and M2. Now, don't take this literally. There is a range of phenotypes between M1 and M2 macrophages, but for simplicity, let's talk about two types. M1 is type of macrophage that will be our target because it, it would lead to prolonged inflammation. And it initiated mostly Th1, or T helper 1 response, it's good because it helps us remove pathogens, but it also can trigger a chronic uh, inflammation. M2 is the macrophage that's more helpful from the point of view of healing. But for example, if you took, take a look at these two from the point of tumor growth progression, then M2 can cause problems because it leads to tumor promotion. What you can appreciate is modulating phenotype and behavior of macrophages can be a powerful therapeutic target and it can be a powerful therapeutic target that's applicable to a variety of inflammatory diseases, including also cancer treatment. We have macrophages throughout our body. So this schematic shows you that, for example, in the liver we have kupfer cells. These are very important to remove toxins and pathogens. These also pick up a lot of nanomedicines uh, once they're injected IV. We'll see later. If we look at the lung, we have alveolar macrophages. They will eliminate dust and allergens, microorganisms. We have macrophages in the spleen, in our intestine, of course, in lymph nodes, and so on. So you can appreciate that macrophages and that lineage is throughout the body and has a variety of homeostatic functions. So that gives me to an important point. We're interested in modulating macrophage behavior, not necessarily removing macrophages. So the focus of our discussion today will be macrophage responding to an insult. This is lipopolysaccharide. This is an example insult. It comes from bacterial walls, and we use it as a model insult in a lot of studies, both in vitro and in vivo. So what's happening, when the macrophage is activated, it will upregulate the COX-2 enzyme. It will also produce pro-inflammatory cytokines. The activation of COX-2 enzyme will lead to production of prostaglandin E2, which feeds back into a loop, further activating macrophages and further uh, producing chemoattractants that will invite more macrophages to the site of inflammation. So what we are dealing with is prostaglandin, and that was the target that we chose for our nanomedicine and nanomodulin development. The prostaglandin comes both from the tissues themselves and also from the macrophages. So we decided to deliver, using targeted delivery approach, to the inflammation sites, COX-2 inhibitors. 
hoping that we will suppress the presence and eliminate prostaglandin, which is one of the reasons more macrophages keep coming along. So we wanted to reduce the macrophage burden at the site of injury and also lead to reduction of inflammation. That recruitment of macrophages to the site of injury can be imaged by both MRI or near-infrared imaging. And that imaging can be done with nanoemulsion. So that leads us to our lead hypothesis. We hypothesized, actually as early as 2010, that we can use non-emulsions designed to be theranostics that carry two imaging modalities, near-infrared and fluorine MRI imaging, and we can deliver COX-2 inhibitors straight to the macrophage. So the idea is we will inject the theranostic non-emulsion. This is a mouse model via a table and injection. The non-emulsion circulates in the bloodstream for a while, gets picked up by macrophages, and those macrophages that are now activated with upregulated COX-2 will migrate to the inflammation site. And we can induce inflammation with a variety of um, irritants, one of them being um, CFA. Finally, when that emulsion that has imaging properties brought the COX-2 inhibitor to those macrophages, the macrophages phenotype is changing. The production of prostaglandin is reduced which can then result in reduction of macrophage infiltration, and we can image that. So our hypothesis was basically this. We proposed that celecoxib is a model COX-2 inhibitor, loaded theranostic non-emulsions will inhibit COX-2 in macrophages, reduce the production of prostaglandin E2, and leads to reduced macrophage infiltration, which then can be imaged. So if we image the macrophage infiltration, we're measuring drug response. And this is why this uh, strategy was defined as theranostic. But before I tell you that story, let me tell you a brief story of where this imaging comes about. There was a nice review article by Irons and Volte in 2013 that summarizes approaches of cell tracking by MRI in live animals. It also describes an approach of how you can quantify the presence of different cell types that are labeled by either nanoparticles, iron oxide, or perfluorocarbon emulsions in variety of tissues using NMR spectroscopy. In our situation, we are basically labeling cells by injecting nanoemulsions into the bloodstream. The macrophages pick up, pick up these nanoemulsions. And then, if the nanomotion is fluorocarbon, per fluorocarbon, when that mouse is put in the scanner, you can collect an atomical image by using proton MRI, and then retune the scanner to record fluorine MRI. This per fluorocarbon doesn't exist in our body, so we have very selective way of imaging that droplet that's carried by macrophages. We can also take the tissues and subject it to NMR spectroscopy and quantify how many droplets would be present in that tissue, which can correspond to the amount of macrophages present in the tissue, which corresponds to level of inflammation. Many groups do this and have been doing it since, uh, I think, early 90s, injecting uh, perfluorocarbon nanoemulsions Macrophages pick them up and go to sites of inflammation. So you can use this technology for an MRI, combined proton MRI, to track macrophages during cardiac infraction, cerebral ischemia, abscess, pulmonary inflammation. Basically, the variety of injuries and disease processes can be imaged this way. So what are perfluorocarbons? Perfluorocarbons are very unique chemical um, class basically hydrocarbons with hydrogens removed and replaced with fluorine. They can be used for imaging, as I just described, MRI, but also optical, ultrasound, photoacoustic, and multimodal imaging. They can be used for drug delivery, including theranostics. They can also be used for oxygen delivery, and that's how the development of nanoemulsions actually began, for fluorocarbon nanoemulsions. 
In our lab, we work with variety of perfluorocarbons. Some of them are shown here. Perfluoropolyethers, perfluoro 15,000, 5-ether. Um, and this is a very simple molecule, perfluorohexane, that has some applications in ultrasound-triggered drug release and other developments. Pure perfluorocarbons are chemically very unique. Physical chemical behavior is very unique. They have low van der Waals forces, and they're very low intermolecular cohesiveness. So sometimes you can find them in the literature that are used as lubricants. They can decrease friction between two surfaces. They resist heating, oxidation, and UV degradation. Sometimes I call them our liquid Teflon little droplets. But what's important for us is they can have high gas dissolving capacity. They can dissolve a lot of oxygen, so that's why there's some applications for oxygen delivery. Their magnetic susceptibility is close to water. And their specific density is what can present as a formulation problem. They're much heavier than water, and they also have high hydrophobicity and high lipophobicity. So if you can show them on a continuum, first of all, carbons are both hydrophobic and lipophobic. This is both useful uh, feature for formulation, but it also can pose some problems. You can imagine formulating them to be stable in uh, the body can present a challenge. In synthetic chemistry, their behavior, they don't, they don't like water or organic solvent, proved to be quite useful. Uh, in late 90s, a synthetic approach called fluorosynthesis was developed, where basically we have fluorous phase, aqueous phase, and organic phase, three liquid phases. And you can tag certain compounds to the fluorous uh, molecules, which will then be pulled into the fluorescent phase, and that allows for very nice synthetic approaches and uh, liquid separations. I took that idea to make the fluorescent perfluorocarbon nanoemulsion, where I wanted my fluorescent dye to be tagged to the fluorous phase of the nanoemulsion. So if you imagine this is my fluorous phase, I introduce the fluorescent dye using um, amid bond formation, and then capped the remaining active esters into non-reactive amides, and then this oil became fluorescently labeled that can be then formulated into an emulsion. And in this example, which we published in 2008 at Carnegie Mellon, in this example, we use these fluorescent nanomulsions to label T cells ex vivo and then introduce them into the mouse, and then the mouse was an image with fluorine MRI to track the cells. This is the same cells. This red is the fluorescent dye tied directly to the fluorous phase of the nanomulsion. A lot of other groups develop these two-phasic systems, where the fluorocarbon is the inner core oil phase, stabilized with surfactants, and then you can introduce drugs and other moieties, targeted moieties, into the surfactant phase. We, in, in 2008 and, and beyond, introduced fluorescent dye tied to the fluorocarbon phase. So there's much work done, and most of it was for imaging, and there's some examples by Wickline and others that use this to, for drug delivery. Our approach in the lab since 2010 was to introduce a third phase, a hydrocarbon phase. And what we then define is what we call three-phase system, or triphasic system, where you have perfluorocarbon, hydrocarbon, and water. That expanded hydrocarbon phase, that we have some evidence, surrounds the fluorocarbon corona, can be then used to deliver anti-inflammatory agents, anti-cancer agents, poorly soluble drugs, and natural products, different imaging probes, whether commercial or synthetic. And we also were able to very nicely stabilize the system. So our typical shelf life is fairly long, over 300 days for non emulsions that are triphasic. We can control the size, and we can have size range from 85 to about 140 nanometers. We have narrow distribution, and these non emulsions are scalable. 
We can also adapt the composition to include multiple imaging modalities, NIR, MRI modalities, PET, and so on. So how do we make these triphasic down emulsions? Well, we have dual mode approach, fluorine MRI and near infrared imaging, and we have therapeutic. For now, this is Cox inhibitor. We combine perfluorocarbons and fluorescent reporters with a solubilizer oil that carries our drug, mixed with surfactants, and then subject to microfluidization or high shear processing. And what we end up getting is our triphase system, perfluorocarbon, hydrocarbon, and water. When that non-emulsion carried the COX-2 inhibitor cell acoxid, we introduced it into macrophages in vitro, which were activated with LPS. So under that activated state, they actually upregulate COX-2. When we introduced the non-emulsion, we delivered the cell acoxid, which inhibits COX-2, which led to reduction of prostaglandin. In this assay, we use ELISA assay to measure the prostaglandin, in cells, and this is comparison of treat, untreated cells, cells exposed to either vehicle for the free drug or LPS, so they have upregulated production of prostaglandin, and then when we introduce the emulsion, we have downregulated that to almost the levels of untreated controls. The non-emulsions, because they carry a fluorescent reporter, can be imaged inside cells, these are macrophages, so everywhere that you see red is a macrophage carrying non-emulsion. And when we study the toxicity of these non-emulsions in vitro, we don't see that we are killing macrophages. On the contrary, they do just find the variety of doses they were exposed to. So can we image macrophages then with these non-emulsions in vivo? And the answer is yes, we can detect non-emulsion accumulation at the inflamed paw by near infrared imaging. This is accumulation of macrophages carrying non-emulsion that's near infrared. The anatomy is presented as x-ray. We can isolate tissues and then subject to fluorine NMR. So now this shows us perfluorocarbon trace in the tissue. And we can compare it to the reference and calculate how much perfluorocarbon or non-emulsion is present in the tissue. And then finally, we can do fluorine-proton MRI combination, where proton MRI shows you anatomy, and fluorine MRI shows you the distribution of droplets in this leg that suffered inflammation. This is a mouse leg. So how do we set up this model? It's a very well-known CFA model where you inject into the pod, the pod starts to swelling, the macrophages start to infiltrate. So in the, there were two groups. In the first group, we injected silicoxid loaded non-emulsion. And after 12 hours, we induced inflammation. At that point, we wanted macrophages to pick up our non-emulsion, and they all carry. And then we studied by imaging and follow-up histology the macrophage accumulation in the tissues. The control received the free drug. What should be said here, the drug dose that's given is incredibly low, and in itself did not show any anti-inflammatory action. It had to be carried by the non-emulsion. So in the control group, we injected the free drug plus the drug-free non-emulsion, and at this point, the non-emulsion serves as an imaging region. And then we repeated the CFA, induction of inflammation, and longitudinal imaging study and histology. How do we introduce these near infrared dyes? The near infrared dyes that we use are lipophilic and they nicely slide into the uh, hydrocarbon surrounding the fluorocarbon in our nanodroplet. So, this is a generalized approach. This is a dye IR, it's a commercially available dye from in vitrogen. You introduce it into the surfactant with an oil mixture subject to emulsification. Once you have this prepared, you can carry your drug injected into the mouse via tail vein injection. And here the mouse suffered inflammation. The inflammation was induced with CFA. So this is a series of images uh, by using a combination of near-infrared imaging and X-ray. So the drug-free non-emulsion 
continues to increasingly accumulate over the course of 72 hours, which corresponds to a continuous increase of macrophage infiltration. But when we introduce into the mouse a drug-loaded nanomulsion, as you can see, the accumulation of macrophages carrying nanomulsions stayed rather low, which suggests that there was less prostaglandin in the tissue, because COX-2 was inhibited, and then less macrophage infiltration. When we went on to quantify it, the groups were equal five, the five animals per group. We were able to quantify the fluorescence and see a nice difference between the drug-free non-emulsions and drug-loaded non-emulsions. We also studied the biodistribution, and as the amount of macrophages went down at the site of inflammation, the number of macrophages in the spleen increased, which suggests we truly changed the macrophage behavior in vivo, and we can measure that. When our collaborators from University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Bino and Dr. Anderson, ran histological analysis, they were able to co-register in the tissue both drug-free and drug-loaded non-emulsions, which are labeled, they show up here as purple, with macrophage markers CD68, and the COX-2. When we ran full cytometry on these tissues, we found that we primarily label macrophages. Our nanodroplets don't seem to label neutrophils or other types of cells that are in that milieu. So nanomulsions co-localize with their target, which is COX-2 expressing macrophages. So how do we produce these nanomulsions? If we want to go towards clinical translation of this approach, we need to worry about how much we can produce and quality control. So this is, brings me to the discussion of our production strategies. As you can see, we use a variety of methods, low temperature emulsification, sonication. Typically, these are done as pre-emulsification step. Our main processing is microfluidization, which we can do from 20 milliliters to about a liter scale easily. Sometimes, depending on what we are blending, we can apply planetary centrifugation to improve the homogeneity of our premixes. These are some examples of perfluorocarbon hydrocarbon surfactant combinations for triphasic nanomotions. As you can see, depending on composition, we can vary the size. We can have 180 to 107 nanometers. PDIs are typically low and below 0.2, and this was published in varied papers, uh, so you can take a look. These perfluoro uh, tertio butyl octal ether, perfluorohexane, perfluoropolyether, and so on, so we can accommodate varying compositions depending on what kind of drug or fluorescent reporter we're trying to deliver. And this shows you the example of perfluorocarbon hydrocarbon non-emulsions or triphasic non-emulsions carrying different types of lipophilic payloads, uh, some commercial fluorescent dyes, some custom designed uh, dyes, and again, varied size and PTR. But we still stay within the range, range of about 80 to 180 nanometers. So one of the formulation challenges that we met with our triphasic nanomotion system is actually a fluorescent reporter developed by Dr. Bai at the University of Pittsburgh Radiology Department. It's very large, uh, highly lipophilic compact that was very nicely fluorescent once incorporated into the nanomotion. This compound was chemically and photostable, which is very important if we want to maintain a high quality of our nanomotions for both optical and fluorine MRI imaging. What's also interesting here is that incorporating this, this design to a micellar solution, just for practice, gave us no fluorescence. But as we were increasing the concentration of the dye, we had a nice increase in fluorescence for different types of emulsions carrying uh, hydrocarbon oil in their corona. The non-emulsions that were carrying commercial dye started losing fluorescence over time under these conditions. But if they, uh, the dye that came from our collaborator remained fluorescent over 60 hours, and then this was also measured by fluorescence uh, spectrum collection. In cells, it had 
comparable and very close behavior to the commercial reporter. So we had very nice fluorescence from QR4, PY in cells. This also shows you that these nanodroplets accumulate ni nicely in cell membrane, in inside the cell membrane in the cytoplasm. The dye did not really impact the performance of nanomotions in respect to cellular toxicity, which is shown here. Because we have two phases, into the core, uh, core of its fluorocarbon, following the chemistry I introduced earlier, we can introduce a fluorescent dye both in the fluorocarbon core and in the hydrocarbon corona. And as you see here, both fluorescent dyes behave as they should in the their excitation and emission spectrum really did not change or impact each other when they were introduced into the nanomotion. What that also allows us is to study these nanomotion droplets more carefully once they are inside cells and tissues. So you can have two fluorescent recorders in one nanomotion, and they can be helpful for some applications. We can also introduce perfluorocarbon and hydrocarbon conjugates. This is a very simple example developed by Chad Frazian and Holy Trinity University in Canada. And what this allows us to do is drive the size further down so we were able to form very small triphasic nanomotions, about 85 nanometers. Finally, we can introduce uh, poorly soluble drugs into the nanomotion. This is a study currently uh, being submitted. The drug contents remain constant over about 42 days in three different temperatures. So the nanomotions uh, sustain their drug loading over time on storage. The colloidal stability was almost identical over 350 days, regardless whether the nanomotion carried a fluorocarbon or not, whether it had a drug or not. And it seems in this example the drug release profile from the nanomotion does not seem to be impacted by perfluorocarbon presence, but this is very uh, preliminary data, so we're following up on this. And so there's a nice uh, release profile that was comparable between the fluorocarbon-loaded and fluorocarbon-free nanomotions carrying the same amount of the same drug. So as I said, our primary concern for theranostic nanomotion is scale up. And this is a study just published recently with um, help uh, of our friends from microfluidics who actually provided the equipment to do this study. So we produced silicoxy loaded theranostic nanomotions, drug free, drug loaded, drug free, drug loaded, and so on, at three levels of scale 54 milliliters, 270, and 1 liter. The first small uh, scale nanomotion was produced on microfluidizer M110S, which we use a lot in the lab. The larger scale was produced on microfluidizer M110EH30, which is, uh, allows us to produce 270 milliliter and 1 liter. This one can also go further up in the volume, but we stopped for a variety of reasons at 1 liter. And we were able to compare the nanomotion uh, properties, whether they were produced on smaller, medium, or large scale, whether they were produced on this equipment, microfluidizer M110S, or a larger uh, type of instrument, M110EH. And this is the data showing that comparisons. And this you can very easily see both drug free and drug loaded nanomotions on all three levels of scale, which means also comparing one instrument to another showed quite nice overlap of their size distributions, or zeta potential was very comparable between them. When they were followed up over time for changes in polar dispersity or average size, which we use dynamic light scattering for that, or pH, there was really no significant change over 12 months. And that's the goal we have for most of our formulations, to be stable at least 12 months. Um, what is also important to mention is all these systems get into the contact with biological fluid, regardless of the route, but typically it's intravenous injection. So what we want to understand is do they have, do they maintain stability under these conditions, which is body temperature and high content of proteins and um, electrolytes where they 
which they experience when they're injecting into the body. So to mimic that, we use 20% beta alkaline serum and 10% beta alkaline serum in cell culture medium, and then we incubate these nanodroplets over time at 37 degrees. In this particular example, we've done that for 14 days, and this nanomotion did not change either size or, or distribution over time. We also subject nanomotions to stressors like centrifugation or filtration, and in these examples you see no change. Um, whether this nanomotion was mixed with serum-containing media or water, and it was centrifuged before or after shows the same size and polydispersity. Filtration also doesn't seem to affect these nanomotions in any uh, significant way, which means it suggests they are fairly stable. Biological testing was very important, so we wanted to make sure that the nanomotion that is scaled up to one liter uh, maintain their um, non-toxic profile. So this is just examples of toxicity data. This is loading volume of um, non-emulsion in the cell culture for a variety of emulsions at different levels of scale, small, medium, and large scale. And as controls, we used free drug and also very well-known toxic drug, doxorubicin. So doxorubicin kills our cells, but the non-emulsions do not. We also went and tested again whether the large-scale non-emulsion produces a pharmacological effect we want, and it, indeed it does. It reduces the prostaglandin production by activating macrophages in vitro. When we run flow cytometry analysis, 99.7% of cells in culture are labeled with our non-emulsions, which means that macrophages uh, really like to eat them in culture and they remain in those cells for quite some time. So in conclusions, the triphasic nanomotions are now emerging out of our lab, and we hope other people will appreciate them as a theranostic platform, especially useful for inflammatory diseases. They can carry multiple imaging modalities and or drugs. The, the, the formulations I share with you specifically label macrophages and allow us to simultaneously image um, their biodistribution, but also understand the therapeutic response as measured by macrophage infiltration level changes. So theranostic nanomedicine can be used also as a tool to study inflammation in vivo, and that's something we are pursuing further. So I'd like to thank my group. This is the current group members, Eric, Simai, Michelle, Mary, and Sherla. I thank them for all their hard work. I would like to acknowledge Shravan Patel, who is a PhD student, graduated in 2015 in March. He's currently a postdoc. He and I uh, jointly developed most of these early studies. Um, I had a variety of PhD students and master's students in my lab over the last uh, five to six years. We have many good friends and collaborators. Who Highlight uh, Carolyn Anderson and Ming Tang Bai from the University of Pittsburgh, John Pollock, Ben Colbert, and others from the Canadian University, and uh, some friends from Canada and, um, and California. We also want to thank Celsense Inc. in Pittsburgh and Microfluidics, being our very long term friends and collaborators. And I'll thank you for your attention.